Okay, so I'm, uh, this is, I'm going to go over, uh, it's going to be a short course. Uh, it's organized into three uh, lectures, and I'll say a little bit about it. Um, I should also say that uh, you are the guinea pigs. This is used for like medical testing and things like that. Uh, so this is the first time I put it together. I've been thinking of putting something together like this for a while and finally got around to doing it. Um, so I'll start with just a few minutes to talk about the overview of the whole course and especially what we're going to cover. There's a huge amount we're not going to cover. So I'll say a little bit about that and also about how you might follow this course. Um, of course, you're following other courses as well. So it might, this might not apply to you, uh, but this is for other things as well. So the first thing is uh, the whole course is online. Uh, there are going to be uh, three lectures. I'm going to get through, I'm going to attempt to get through the first one uh, today. If I don't, then we'll just simply start as far as I got today, tomorrow. Um, and then uh, everything, absolutely everything, uh, is also in IPython notebooks, okay? All of which are online and, you know, the obvious place you can find these things. Um, now, the, the course goal is actually, I mean, just to be very clear about it, it's basically to bring you from zero to functional in convex optimization. So that's, that's kind of the idea. Now, that means it, we're not going to focus on things like, you know, the theory. Uh, I'm going to say absolutely zero about algorithms. I will say why later. Uh, I'll get to that. Um, but what we're going to focus on is uh, problem formulation. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of applications, and we're actually going to be talking a little bit about uh, coding in a, high, in a high le higher level languages, domain specific languages uh, for optimization. Um, so that's going to be the focus. Um, now what we're not going to cover, uh, and these are absolutely fascinating things, I mean this, this you cover in a longer course, uh, is things like the theory, which is actually extremely interesting, quite complete, beautiful. Um, we're, gonna, we're not going to talk about ideas like duality and optimality conditions. These are fascinating. I, as I said, we'll say absolutely nothing about how to solve a convex optimization problem. I'll say nothing about it. Uh, actually, that's intention it's weird, and it's intentional, and I will explain why that's the case later. Um, okay, uh, and the prerequisites for this course, I mean, certainly everybody here has this, so I don't have to say this, but this is a generic course. I mean, the prerequisites are, you have to know linear algebra, probability, some basic, very basic computer science. Um, and if you're going to follow along, uh, in fact, the whole point of this is that you should not be reading about uh, optimization, you should actually be doing it, okay? And if you're doing it, then you need to do this in, the, in something like Python or Julia or, or MATLAB. Now, hope, I'm assuming here, hopefully you haven't, none of you have been poisoned yet with MATLAB. There are whole fields, you know, which have been... Uh, <laughs> It's sad when I, so I, but I'm, I'm more comfortable when I'm in with people who haven't yet been poisoned. I come from one of those fields, by the way, where, so, okay, so, all right. So the outline is I'm going to start, the, the first lecture, which I will start today, um, is uh, just an overview, um, and it's going to start very slowly, so it's going to look like we haven't done anything. Half an hour, 45 minutes into the talk, you're going to be sitting thinking, these, Nothing has happened. Uh, that's going to change, don't worry. Uh, by the middle of the second one, uh, we will have done something. Um, but just, it's, we're going to start slow. And it's actually good to start slow to talk about the big picture. Like, you know, what, you know, what, what is optimization? Why, why should you use what is it? What do you use it for? It's actually quite interesting. Um, now, if you were going to actually do this seriously, and I would hope that some of you would, even if you are taking other things, um, then a, a very good thing to do uh, today, this afternoon, tonight, uh, would be to read the first chapter of, uh, of, of this book, um, which is also at a very high level, um, and then to do something like install, uh, install one of these packages and make sure you can actually make it run, right? So make, make some baby problem solve it. So, so that, that would be the first thing to do. That's if you really wanted to learn the material. Um, so if you don't, then just listen or something like that. <laughs> That's fine. Um, the second one, uh, the second lecture is actually going to get technical, and it's going to work like this. We're going to talk about constructive convex analysis. Um, and so this is where I'll, I'll teach you a very small, carefully chosen subset of convex analysis, right? It's actually, a lot of it is quite advanced, but it's a very small subset. Um, and it happens to be the subset that is also uh, has a, an implementation uh, in various domain-specific languages, in various languages that would allow you to, to follow exactly the mathematics we're going to talk about, right? So, so that's, uh, that's that. And there'd be various things you can do. I'll say it at the time, things you can do then. 
And the third lecture is simply ap just a set of applications. Uh, they're chosen to be from the different types of areas that you use op optimization in. So I'll, uh, I'll get into that very shortly. Um, and there, the idea is that by that point, you should be OK. You should be able to uh, do these things by yourself and so on. So this is the idea. Um, and I'll come back to this at the very end of the course, um, like what, what to do next. And I think at that point, we're going to go ahead and just start. Oh, and I should say that this was put together with uh, a, a student of mine, Stephen Diamond, who also just happens to be the author of uh, CVX Pi as well, so which we'll, we'll talk about at various points in the, in, in the lectures. Okay, so we're going to start in on an overview. Um, I should say this, that my guess is that many of you know actually a fair amount about convex optimization, I'm guessing. Because, um, you know, I, I, I move in a lot of crowds and I know a bunch of people, and so I'm guessing uh, people, in machine, I mean, people in machine learning typically know a lot. What's interesting is they know kind of weird, some stuff like very advanced topics and then some very basic stuff, not at all. So even though, so it's intentional that the talk is very basic, right? So if you came here expecting to hear about the latest, you know, uh, you know, bounds for semi-definite relaxations and blah, 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 you're going to be sorry. Instead, you're going to learn something actually much more useful, <laughs> so uh, much more basic. So, okay. So we'll start with just optimization. So here's an optimization problem. Um, there's a variable uh, you have to choose. Uh, this is uh, a vector x, um, and that's something you have to choose. And there is an objective. Uh, function f0 that tells you how much you uh, actually tells you how much you dislike the choice of x because we're going to minimize. Of course, you can also maximize, you know, something. And in many fields, you find that people will maximize a utility, a profit, or something like that, or a margin. Um, but we'll minimize. It's just easier just to always do the same thing. So we're going to minimize. Um, and so this is a measure of your dislike of the choice x. Okay. Um, there are constraints. Uh, these, uh, these, there's equality constraints. It says that uh, a bunch of equality constraints must hold. And there's a bunch of inequality constraints that have to hold uh, as well, right? These would be things like uh, resource limits. This would be something like, you know, a market has to clear or something like that. So these are, the, these are this type. Or this is some equilibrium has to hold or something like that. That's typically what these are. OK. Um, and there's variations on this. You can maximize an objective like a utility function or something. Um, and of course, no real problem has one objective that's infinitely soft, and then all the other objectives are infinitely hard. Real problems, in fact, generally involve trade-offs, right? So I don't even know one problem where there's not at least two actual objectives, in which case you can have multiple objectives and make trade-off curves and things. I mean, this is kind of obvious. Yes? Are you making assumptions already over the function? Absolutely none. Okay, could be yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And I should say, please ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I'll repeat the question. The question was, uh, she wasn't quite familiar with inequality and equality constraints. And so I'll tell you, here, this, the semantics of this is very, very simple. If you propose a candidate vector x, and I evaluate gi of x, if I get 0, everything's cool. If I get anything other than 0, that vector x is infeasible, meaning it's, it, it's completely unacceptable. That's, what it, that's the semantics of it. The semantics here is similar, right? So that's, what, that, that's the meaning. OK. So, Let's talk about why you'd use optimization. Yeah. By the way, I want to remind you there's absolutely no assumptions so far made. Right? So that's, this is just optimization period. OK. Well, in one broad class of uh, problems, um, this, this vector x represents an action. It's something that you do. It's something that, that you know, you're going to actually act, and something's going to happen. Um, and it could be, for example, that could represent the trades in, if you're running a hedge fund. This would be how much of each thing to buy and sell, or which derivatives to, you know, which, what various actions that you take. Um, these could be real actions. Like, actually, these, this could tell you in the next 20 milliseconds, uh, how should you adjust the thrust on your four engines? How should you change the uh, control surfaces on your airplane, right? Um, this could be a schedule or an assignment. Right? So presumably in that case, x would be a Boolean vector, and its entries would tell you, you know, which processor uh, handles which job, for example. Right? So that would be a scheduler and assignment. Um, it could be resource allocation. Right? So this could be at a data center, 
And this could tell you uh, I might have 55 different jobs running or classes of jobs running, and this tells me how, much, how, many CP, how many cores should I allocate to job one, how many to job two, how much I.O. bandwidth, and so on and so forth, right? So these are, could be resource allocations. Um, or it could be something like a transmitted signal, right? So my phone or something like that uh, transmits the signal wirelessly, and the question is, you know, what exact signal should I transmit, right? So these are, these are things where you solve an optimization problem, and the result is actually an action. Something happens. I was going to say physically in all cases, but uh, this one, in this case, what happens is a fixed packet uh, goes, to a goes to a trading engine and a reply comes back, right? So I suppose that's physical in some way. Okay. Now, in these cases, um, the constraints, uh, they limit the actions or they impose conditions on the outcome, right? So for example, uh, if, if you're run, if you're in portfolio optimization, you cannot, it, in some cases, by law, you cannot have a short position. And so some things would be, some, some trades would be actually literally against the law, right? right? Or against policy or something like that. Um, or they'd be outside of the possible range of actions, right? Um, they could tell you something like, if you're doing resource allocation, uh, and I, the total number of cores I'm assigning has to be less than the total number of cores available. I mean, obviously, right? Um, meanwhile, the objective is something which, for which the smaller it is, the better, the happier you are. And this could be something like, you know, total cost or negative profit in, a, in, in finance or something, in, or in some business setting. Um, it could be a deviation from a desired or target outcome. So you might have some desired trajectory you want to follow, say for an airplane, and this could be a deviation from that trajectory. And the closer you are to that trajectory, the better you are. This could be a perfect glide slope down that touches down right at a perfect point, you know, whatever, 100 meters uh, after, you know, from, the, from the beginning of the runway, right? That'd be, that, that's the trajectory you want to follow. Um, it could be fuel use, right? It could be risk in, in, portfo in a portfolio. So you want to achieve certain things, uh, but you want to minimize the, the risk associated with uh, that, that choice. Okay. So this is this is the most obvious case where you optimize because you're just you're, do, you're actually trying to figure out what is the best thing to do. Okay. Um, another area, I mean, which is actually kind of the same thing as engineering design. It's the same thing except the time scale is much longer, right? So when you're figuring out what the right thing to do is, it could be even on a 10 millisecond or one millisecond basis. It could be every minute. It could be every hour. It could be every day or something like that, right? If you're working out a schedule, it might be every day. Um, or if you're doing uh, supply chain optimization, it might be every day. Um, another one is uh, engineering design. So here you're actually designing some object, and obviously that's something that happens not on a daily basis, but you know, on a six-month, 12-month basis. So the time scale is just different, right? And the idea is that the components of X represent a design, right? Could be a circuit, and I guarantee you every circuit and every, all, everything that you have in front of you or in your pocket, uh, there was extensive optimization used. In fact, it's probably worthwhile pointing out, especially to a machine learning crowd, that none of what you do would be even remotely possible if, if people in electrical engineering, by the way, not me, <clears throat> but my friend, my colleagues at least, uh, were not optimizing and designing circuits for you, right? So a lot happens there, right? So, um, so these might be, for example, the widths and lengths of devices. And the idea is the constraints would be, well, the manufacturing process, right? The, the width of a, a gate can't be any shorter than, let's say, 15 nanometers, right? So, I mean, you can ask for it to be shorter, it'll just be rejected by the fab, right? Uh, or, or it won't work if they let you do it, right? So, that's the idea. And you have performance requirements, right? You'd say, well, this thing has to clock at 800 megahertz, or something like that, right? Or 3.2 gigahertz. So, that, that, that's, a manu that's a performance requirement. And the objective, well, there's probably many. One would be cost, but one would be weight, power, that's critical for, uh, for devices like uh, uh, anything that's portable. The less power you use, the better, right? So, so that's the idea of engineering design. Um, here's one, probably much closer to what you know about. Um, but here, the meaning of the, of the variable x that you're choosing is it's not, these are not, you know, the lengths or widths of physical things. Um, they are not actions that you do, like change the thrust on your inboard left engine. Right? These are not, they're not actions. What they are is they're parameters in a model. So you have a, a model of a data model. 
And the constraints would impose requirements on model parameters. For example, part of x might represent a covariance, and you'd say, well, the covariance has to be non-negative, you know, of course, right? So that would be one. Or it might represent sources in something, and the sources have to be non-negative. They cannot be negative, right? It's, uh, uh, and the, ob the objective is going to be two things. Again, I'll go quickly because this is something everyone here would be familiar with. The objective is going to have two things. It's going to have one term is going to be something like a prediction error on some observed data. That's a loss on some data that you've seen. And there's going to be a second term that's going to penalize model complexity and allows you to generalize. Right? So we'll talk about all these things later, but in any case, you know about all these things. So the point here is, when you solve an optimization problem in this context, when you look at what the 14th component of X is, it's not an action. It's not how much to buy of a certain asset. It is not, uh, it's not the width of a, of a particular beam in a building that you're designing or a bridge. Right? Here, it's actually a parameter in a data model. Right? So that's the idea. Okay. Um, inversion. Uh, I'm, call, I'm calling this, it's actually the same as estimation, but they use a different language, right? So these are people who, well, typically it's sort of more physically based. If you do medical uh, imaging or if you do geophysics or something like that, people use the word inversion. I actually don't know why it's extremely, it's, it's actually the wrong term and it's very unsophisticated anyway, right? So, I mean, I suppose the idea is something happened and it got transformed and you want to invert the transform. Well, okay, fine, right? Um, so, but the idea is that X is something you want to measure, you want to estimate or reconstruct, and you're given a measurement of it. Uh, the constraints are going to come from prior knowledge about X, right? So it could be that X is sparse, that it's non-negative, these kinds of things, right? Um, and the objective is going to measure something like a deviation between the predicted and actual measurements, and it could have a term, uh, if, if this is not fixed knowledge, uh, then that's something that could go into the objective, right? So, so that's the idea. That's, that's generally called inversion. Right, so, okay. Finally, um, another area, um, and it's got a great name, is worst case analysis, and this is Stephen Johnson at MIT came up with this name, so this is pessimization, right? So, now the idea here is that so far, everything, the idea, the semantics was we were adjusting the X's to make things as good as they could be, you know, the best model, uh, the least fuel used to move your satellite back onto the position it's supposed to be on, right? So. These would be, these, these are the idea of actions. Here, you're actually optimizing things to make things as bad as they can possibly be. So that's the idea. So that's worst case analysis. So what happens is the variables are actions and, or parameters that are out of your control, right? And they are possibly under the control of an adversary, okay? So that's the, uh, that's the idea. Um, and the constraints limit the possible values of the parameters, right? And then you're going to minimize minus F0 of X. That's the same as maximizing F0. And that tells you the worst possible thing that can happen, right? So this is the idea. And then the whole point of this is if the worst possible value is, is tolerable, then you're okay. Or at least you have much greater confidence, right? Um, and it, even if it's not okay, it's actually really good to know what the worst possible scenario is, right? So if you're running a hedge fund and, I, it, it's, and you say, you know what, I don't really know these parameters, these are ranges, and you work out what the worst possible thing that can happen to you is, and it's not terrible, then you feel better, I suppose. I mean, I guess, right? So, um, By the way, actually, I, I have friends who do this. I don't know the details, but they claim that essentially this idea is all of generalization. This is how generalization and statistical learning works. But I, I'm not going to go into that because you'd know a lot more than I do. OK. Um, a final category, uh, and these are not distinct, right? These categories, they overlap and things like that, right? So um, is optimization-based models. And this is actually worth thinking about. I mean, all of these things you've seen somewhere before, but maybe no one ever organized them into these categories before. This is actually quite interesting. So the idea is that you build a model of something, uh, a data. Uh, but you do it is you model the entity as taking actions that solve an optimization problem. So that's the idea. Okay? And so here's one. Oh, let's take, for example, economics. There, the entire field. Okay? So there. I'm classical economics, I might add, right? So, you, you know, the, so the idea is basically you model an ent each entity is making choices that maximize expected utility, okay? So that's, uh, that's the idea. Um, you, you might have in biology, there's something now that's actually very interesting. The idea is that an organism will act to maximize its reproductive success, right? So 
um, reaction rates in a cell uh, maximize growth, right? Um, oh, here, this is a very old idea from 1870. Currents in an electric circuit, they organize themselves in such a way as to minimize total power. That's Maxwell showed that, so that's 1870. Actually, this ties into you know, a, a good chunk of all of physics is variational, or is variational inequalities and variational principles, right? And so the idea that certain things are actually solving optimization problems, like, for example, propagation of light, uh, e and M, things like that, uh, these are not new ideas, right? Um, now, by the way, in those cases, they are as exact as those laws are, which are, by the way, extremely exact, right? So, uh, so and th this is not an approximation. The rest of these are... Uh -oh. There we go. The rest of these are gross approximations, right? If you're doing, if you're, if you're doing some, if you, if you look at a cell and you ask, how do, what does a cell do? If you like turn off this gene or that one or something like that, what does it do? Or what happens if you stress it, if you raise the temperature and, and change the concentration of something in its environment, what does it do? The answer is it does biology. It's in, it's un, whatever it does is unbelievably complicated, right? All sorts of chemistry and all sorts of other stuff is happening. I know nothing about all this, but it turns out Models that are extremely crude and just basically say, I don't know, the reaction rates are going to do something that's going to maximize cell growth have unusually good, I mean, actually, it's kind of spooky how good the predictive ability is, right? Uh, by the way, same for here, right? If I take a couple of you and I ask, you know, what, 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 you, what, what you're going to do in some situation, of course, I can't predict. What, if you ask a person, what are you doing? They say, I'm choosing which car to buy. And you say, oh, but you must be maximizing expected utility. And they go, no, I'm buying a car. I'm not a maximize. You get 50 people, and all of a sudden, again, if you fit, if you use sophisticated methods to fit the model, you're actually going to start making pretty good predictions at 50 people or 100 people. Not, not even get the, I mean, don't even worry about getting to 10,000, right? Um, so these are actually very, it's a very interesting, there's very interesting ideas here. Um, actually, this is kind of a challenge to people in machine learning. Here's my challenge is, uh, how are you going to come up with models that do this? Uh, by the way, all the existing models you have, like you know, little, uh, various ones, are, are actually solving optimization problems. You just don't know what they are because it's a quadratic optimization problem, and therefore it's expressed as a linear function. Right? That's all of regression. Right? So my question would be, how do you fit these things? It's actually quite interesting. Um, what's interesting about these is that they work really, really well. Um, OK, so the summary is optimization comes up everywhere. That's the, uh, that's the, 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 that's the main point here. Um, and now the bad news. Uh, you can't solve any problems, right? So that's the bad news, right? So, okay. So, exactly, right? So, but it's not, you know, it's, it's okay. I mean, actually, it turns out there's a huge value in at least the intellectual uh, discipline of trying to state what you want. Right, because a lot of times you talk to people in some field, they can't even say what they want, right? And I, I sort of stop them usually, and I'd say, "Stop, stop, stop! What would make you happy?" And they'd say, "Oh, I'd be happy if I could reproduce this image and blah blah." And I'm like, "Just stop, stop! How would you know if you were happy? You know, can you?" And anyway, so it takes a while before people think about it. And I'd say, "Well, what's completely unacceptable?" And then so on. And eventually, you can get it. But okay, so. So this is, uh, this, you'd have to say this is kind of bad news, right? Uh, so it turns out, actually, you, what you can do is you can just modify what you mean by solve, right? So for example, one option is to make solve mean not solve. Uh, or you put a little asterisk here, and then down here at the bottom, it says not really, right? <laughs> and this is fine. I mean, and then what it is is that you're, it, it, you're really not optimizing. You're, you're making something better, right? So I don't know if there's a verb for that. But that would be, you're just making something a little bit better. Right? Um, that's fine. That, a lot of people do that. It works, right? There is one huge exception, right? And that's going to be uh, convex optimization problems, right? So that's a huge exception. Um, and these are tractable, right? And that means we generally we can solve them, right? So that's the, in fact, that's the way I think of them, right? So another way to think of them is they're the trivial problems, which is fine, which is just no, no problem. Actually, this goes much farther uh, than just here. Uh, there are there's an extreme point of view, I think it's a bit silly, that basically says any, any problem you can actually solve, is you can solve it because there's a convex formulation. Now that's getting a bit weird. That'd be like, you know, you take your favorite uh, combinatorial optimization problem, like, you know, shortest path on a graph, right? And then, I mean, it's stupid, you can solve it because you can work out you know, whatever you like, Bellman 4, what is something, and get the shortest path. It's not that big a deal, right? Um, 
But then this extreme point of view would say something weird like this. They'd say, oh, no, no, that's because the, you know, the linear programming relaxation you can prove is tight. Everybody got this? So, so anyway, it's, so there are weird people who say it's not true that convex optimizations are tractable. Um, basically, uh, tractable problems are convex, I guess. Uh, I mean, I think that's kind of stupid, but anyway, okay. All right, so now let's get into what it is. By the way, there's been no technical stuff whatsoever, and now there'll be a little tiny bit. Here we go. So a convex optimization problem, it's a subclass of uh, optimization problems with a couple of requirements, uh, actually not that many. The equality constraints must be linear, right? So that, that's the equality constraints have to be linear. That's first. Uh, the second is that the objective function and the constraint functions here must be convex. So that means that they have to just, if you plot the graph, they have to have non-negative curvature, right? By the way, zero curvature, which is affine functions, is fine. That's on the, that's on the boundary, right? But they have to have non-negative curvature. Okay. Why should you study these? Well, actually, there's a beautiful theory uh, involving things like duality, optimality conditions. I'm not going to say one thing about it this entire time, which is fine. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 we can, but actually most problems involving uh, stochastic things, we're going to see some. They, they very quickly either become directly convex optimization problems or they're beautiful approximations of them. We'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. So, okay, so there's beautiful stuff. We're not going to cover one bit of it. Uh, there are effective algorithms that solve these problems. Uh, in theory and in practice, you get the global solution. Uh, they have low complexity. Um, but again, we're not gonna say, I'm not going to say one more thing about that. That's the last thing I'm going to say about it. Because I actually believe it's more fun to see what you can do with it. It's much more important to see what you can do with it, the range of things you can do with it. And then once you're convinced that there's actually a large number of things, then it's time to look at these things. And the truth is, we don't need everybody in the world coming up with a new algorithm, right, every day, right? So, which is what's happening now. Anyway, there really are only about four algorithms, in fact, and people keep reinventing them. So. There's something, uh, you know, I don't know. This doesn't seem like the right, okay. Um, one useful thing is that you get, it's, you get conceptual unification of many methods, right? Things that don't look like they're related actually are not only related, they're kind of the same, which is actually very interesting. It makes people very nervous sometimes when I tell them, oh, hey, your field is connected to that field, and these are people who hate each other. <laughs> I know examples of it. So, so uh, the most famous example of that is, uh, is circuit design and information theory. Right, so these are two fields which are actually, they define the diameter of EE, electrical engineering, right? Because if you do information theory, you're basically doing math. I might even add pure math, right? If you do circuit design, you do circuit design precisely because you hate math. And you hate people who do math. I mean, and by the way, I have, I have friends on, on both ends, right? So, who, each of whom views me with suspicion because I hang out with the other people sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah, so these, these are basically in, in intellectual space, I don't know, which is probably like five-dimensional, right? Uh, in intellectual space, if you plot our department, it's got a very big diameter. Um, and these, are, these would be the two farthest points intellectually. And then, so it turns out, it's hilarious, it turns out if you look at a lot of circuit design, these are geometric programs, and the duals of these are actually information theory problems. So they, I've told my friends, and they get very nervous about this. They don't, they don't like it at all. Uh, so, okay. So there's a lot of applications. I'm not going to go, I mean, we're going to see a bunch of these, not all, but we'll see a whole bunch of them before this is over. Um, machine learning statistics, you know, obviously. Uh, finance areas like supply chain, revenue management, advertising is entirely moving this way. Um, control, uh, signal and image processing, vision, networking, circuit design, combinatorial optimization, lots of areas in quantum mechanics, in biology it's being used, genetics, all sorts of stuff like that. So I'm not going to go into any of the details here. Um, uh, by the way, in a, some of these cases, people would not, probably don't even have the self-awareness that they're doing convex optimization, right? So, um, so an example of that would be someone doing supply chain using some particular method that's in the dialect that they speak. And they, maybe they know something's a quadratic program, but they're not sure. Anyway, so, I'm just, so just if you bump into someone or know someone who does some of these things, and they'd say, never heard of it, that makes sense. Okay. So what's the approach? The approach is going to be this. You're going to try to formulate your optimization problem as convex, right? That's, that's, that's the idea. And if you succeed, you can usually solve it numerically. Now, we're going to talk about some of these things. If your problem is not huge, then generic software, oh, and you don't have any real-time constraints. 
right, or it's not going to be embedded in something, then fine, done. Actually, if it's not too late for you, I'd recommend you go into a field like that because it'll be much easier on you. I don't, well, it depends. <laughs> but, so, by the way, if you've, already, if you've already determined you're going into medical imaging, my apologies. So, so then that's fine. Um, you know, if, if your problem is, is, is either big or has a hard real-time deadline, like you're doing control, uh, then you're going to have to probably write your own software for it. Um, that's fine. Okay. Um, now, there's tricks, right? So there's changes of variables. Uh, there's approximation of true objectives and constraints. And there's relaxation, right? So uh, these are just standard tricks in a long course. Uh, I teach a 10-week course on this at, at Stanford. It's a lot of work. I mean, people work like 20 hours a week on it. Um, you would see all of these things, right? And some of them are actually very interesting, even theoretically. Uh, for example, you quickly find out, uh, for example, in statistics, if I, if I ask you, oh, here are some samples of a Gaussian... Uh, from a Gaussian distribution, please estimate the mean and covariance, right? which you'd think, okay, what could be more natural? It turns out that's it's not a convex problem. It's just not, right? So it turns out, strangely, well, probably for some of you it's not strange, it turns out the correct variables are the inverse of the covariance matrix and the inverse of the covariance matrix times the mean. Uh, and in fact, these are the natural parameters uh, in an exponential model right, exponential family model. So if you know statistics, this all makes sense. Weirdly, turns out that's exactly what it takes to transform it to a convex problem. Some of these things are not obvious, by the way. Um, so you can do approximation, right? So approximation can be mild and it can be strong, right? Uh, mild means you, you, someone, you say, how much fuel does it use? And they go, oh, here, and they give you a book this thick. And they say, oh, here's all the data from our engine tests. And you're, you're like, I, I'm not going to read that. You're out of the question, right? And then you fit it with something, you know, some new, you get some actual data, and you fit it, and you're plus minus 5%, and that's good enough. Everybody, that's, this is fine, right? Um, what's weird, though, is we're not going to talk about it, but often gross, ridiculous approximations are made, ones that are so implausible it's, in, it's crazy. Um, so here would be one, for example, is I might, you might say, I'd like the vector to be sparse. And you say, well, you know, instead I'm going to minimize the L1 norm. I mean, this is, these are just not, it's not like one is within 5% of the other, right? These are gross approximations. These work shockingly well, right? So, um, and the final one is relaxation. And that means that you write it all down. There's a, bunch of, there's a bunch of things you can handle, but there's constraints or objective terms that are not convex. And so you simply choose to ignore them. Right, so that's, that's what relaxation is. Now, note, however, that relaxation makes it sound very sophisticated, right? And what you're actually doing is you're simply commenting out constraints. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. And it sounds better if you say, oh, this is a semi-definite relaxation of this problem, which is hard to solve. Yes, you had a question. For example, when you say that f must be convex, you mean like the unbounded version of x, uh, of f should be, bound, uh, should be convex, right? What, do you, what is the unbounded version? So, for example, if I tell you the sinus of x, Yes. So the sinus of x, but only between 0 and pi, then it's a convex version. Yeah, that's f. Do you, if, it, so, hang on. If you mean that your function is sine x, then it is not convex. If you mean it's sine x restricted to that range, of course it's convex. Ah, okay, so the bounded, okay. So I don't know what bounded version. There's a, something called a function, and you define a function. It's either convex or it's not. Okay. okay. So, and if your function is sine x for all x, it's not. If your function is sine x between... To, or with your domain where it's convex, then that function is convex. Okay? Any other questions? That's correct. Right. We're going to talk at great length about that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I can tell you right now that it's NP hard to show, even with a small, so even just polynomial, determine if it's convex or whatever. So it's not. That's, a, that's hardly surprising, I think. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about now is uh, solvers and modeling languages, and that's going to be kind of a theme through all of this. So actually, the, the idea here is, uh, the idea of this course is to sort of jump, to compress a whole bunch of stuff and skip a lot of actually fascinating stuff about the theory, relaxation, duality, blah, blah, all that kind of stuff, and go from zero to functional. And so we'll, we'll just jump ahead and, and tell you about solvers and modeling languages. It's actually quite interesting. So we'll start with medium-scale solvers. Uh, so you know, if you've got thousands of variables, maybe 10,000, maybe 100,000 variables or more, um, and enough sparsity, you can solve these by interior point methods on a single machine, right? So this is just not, uh, this is not too hard to do. Um, and that's with, you know, I, 
fairly extreme reliability, right? The generic ones will do this with reliability, you know, 99.9% .9 or something. And modifications of them can make that 100%. Just, they, they don't fail ever, period, right? So that, then you would need that for an embedded system. Um, let's see. And it depends on the problem class. Um, these will exploit sparsity. Um, and then you would use these in control, finance, engineering, design, things like that, right? So these are, this, these are sort of medium scale uh, solvers. Um, if you want to do large scale solvers, right, this would be things that are 100,000 to a billion variables. You can go more than that too. It's not a big deal because these things scale. Um, you would use some kind of, you know, typically problem specific method, right? So you could use, you know, limited memory BFGS, stochastic subgradient, you know, all these block coordinate descents, operator splitting methods. And in fact, I mean, actually, while I've already started this course, so, oh yeah, sure, it's been 30 minutes, so there's been multiple papers published on each of these and variations, I might add, right? So, yeah, I presume by none, no one here. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I mean, you know, this is every time you turn around, somebody has some new, you know, fancy method that, you know, whatever. Uh, okay. Um, all right. Um, now, these typically require custom implementation tuning for each problem, right? And so these are, this is, of course, what you'd use for machine learning, right? If you were going to solve an SVM problem, I mean, why would you not use some, you know, lib SVM or one of, the, you know, something like that that's been made for that specific problem, right? Um, if you're going to do image processing, of course you would use some image processing library or something like that that's specifically made for that problem. And you might think, by the way, how could it be any different? Uh, well, let me tell you uh, <laughs> that if you go back 10 years, uh, people, we now solve just routinely, I can write six lines of code and solve a finance problem on my laptop, single thread, that 10, 15 years ago, people assumed uh, could only be solved on some giant computer with, you know, 12 people with white jackets and the whole thing, this kind of thing, right? So it's like really, so if you do something that has a billion variables, you say, oh, well, yeah, of course I'm going to have to roll my own on, on an algorithm, of course, because mine are just too big, you know, blah, just watch out. <laughs> or, or find out about Moore's Law or something. So, okay, all right. I should say one postscript on that is I have never found, historically, I've never heard or encountered a convex optimization problem that people wanted to solve that they could not eventually do, right? So, so for example, in control, it would be they'd solve semi-definite programs and stuff like that. And, and unfortunately, those were small enough that they would use generic software, usually made by my group. And then the way they would do is they'd try it, and if it didn't work, they would complain to us. So the good news was the machine learning and statistics stuff was way out of our range, so we couldn't solve anything but trivial problems. And so, actually, the good news is in that field, you have people much more sophisticated about optimization, which is good, right? Same for imaging and stuff like that. So that's actually good. Okay. Modeling languages. So the idea is you have high-level language support for convex optimization. So you describe a problem in a high-level language, and then you, uh, that's automatically transformed to a standard, uh, a standard form solved by a standard solver, and then transform back. And there are lots of implementations of this. Now, I shouldn't say lots. There are many, and there are precursors I'm not mentioning here. But there would be things like uh, YALMIP and, and CVX. These are in MATLAB. Uh, CVX PIs and Python. Um, there's a, a Julia. The Julia stuff is very well, reasonably well developed uh, right now. So these are what these things uh, are. And we'll talk a great deal about them uh, in the next lecture. Um, but just to see a quick overview of what these look like. Um, so this is in, uh, you know, unfortunately MATLAB, but anyway, here it is, uh, historically. Um, so the source might look like this. If you, if you say CVX begin and CVX end, everything in between declares an optimization problem. And the semantics is that this declares an optimization problem, this finishes the declaration and asks it to be solved. Okay? So, what will happen is, in this, uh, in this, I mean, it's completely readable, right? This says there's a variable x. Of course, between here and before this executes, uh, x is an object. It's a variable. It's an optimization variable, not, not a numeric vector. Um, and it says you minimize, you know, sum of square of, this is, of course, interpreted element-wise, of ax minus b, um, and then plus gamma times norm x1. It's all completely readable. Oh, and by the way, a, b, and gamma are constants, and gamma has to be non-negative. Okay? Um, and what will happen is at the end here, this will be converted into a, uh, a standard form, and it'll be solved. Um, 
this one will be feasible, because it is feasible. Uh, and in that case, the variable up here, which is an object, will be overwritten with the numerical solution and will become a numerical vector. That's, that's MATLAB style. Well, OK, so that's it. OK, so this is the idea. Um, OK. CVX pi, um, this is uh, Python. And so it's, you know, it's more Pythonic. So it looks like this. The interesting things are that, so that's a, this instant, that's a variable. That's a constructor for a variable. And x is now a variable object. Um, you form an expression. By the way, this lives outside of an optimization problem variables in CVX pi. Um, actually, in any object-oriented system, they live outside, uh, outside problems. So this, you construct a variable. And then you form an expression. That's, so cost is an expression. And it would be this expression. And then here's the constructor for creating a problem. Um, and you'd say, this is actually, that actually is a constructor for making a, uh, that's a constructor for making an objective, right? So it says, it says minimize cost. That actually, that, this is an objective. And this says a problem is constructed with an objective and a list of constraints. In this case, it has just one element in the list. And that is mathematically correct. It's a problem. That's exactly what a problem is, right? And then if you call the solve method on the problem, and there could be options, but if you call the solve method, um, it'll return the, the double, which is the optimal value, right? Um, and then this has a side effect of writing on the value attributes of all of the variables. And I might add all of the expressions and things like that, right? So for example, in this case, if you had x dot value, it would actually give you the numeric values, right? So this is the idea. And we're going to see a lot more of this tomorrow. And of course, you have something in Julia as well. Um, oh, I should add, uh, CVX Pi was, was implemented by Stephen Diamond when he was an undergraduate in math and computer science. So um, convex.jl uh, was actually written. She's a PhD student of mine. All the rest are undergrads. No, I guess I'm not an undergrad. Um, but these are all undergrads in computer science and math, right? They're not randomly selected ones, so before you get the wrong idea, they're, they were very good. Uh, undergrads. But the point is, if you know a little bit of math, you know undergraduate computer science, you don't need to know anymore. This, these are not complicated things. By the yes. way, the core of uh, CVX uh, Pi, uh, is it in C++ or it's in Python as well? The core yeah. is about 40 lines of Python. Ah. Okay. It's 40 lines, okay. approximately, right? Library is not very big. Uh, the solvers are, of course, the solvers are written in C. But actually, Part of the theme of this course, I'm going to move you away from, so I give talks a lot of times, and I'll say, OK, here are the results. People say, how'd you solve that problem? And sometimes, actually, I even started doing, just to bait the audience, I'd say, none of your goddamn business. <laughs> and they would say, oh, did you use like a primal dual, blah, blah? And I'm like, I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm just not saying. Just to irritate, and they'd get, it would enrage them. And they'd say, you used, you used Nesterov accelerated, blah, 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 dual, sub, mirror, sub, and I'm like, I'm not saying. And then the whole point is, I'd say, they'd say, why? And I'd say, look, because the whole point is it's, it's convex. There's a gazillion ways to solve it, and they all have to get, now we have to be very careful, the informal way to say it is the same answer. Answer means the objective. If there's multiple optimal points, the contract of any solver is to produce merely one point that's optimal, right? So, so I think, so, so, anyway, so, so you can keep, ask me that periodically, so I can say that again. It's good, it's very good. No, no, I know. I just asked about efficiency, that's all. Okay, no, no. So, so, uh, oh, efficiency, it's not, it's not efficient. It's, that's, that's, oh, okay. so now I'm, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay. Okay. So the idea of modeling languages, then, is, um, so they enable rapid prototyping, right? Certainly for small and medium scale problems. Actually, I can say there's a little bit of stuff happening there. And it's great for teaching, right? So I, I taught a course on convex optimization before the development of these things that actually worked and afterwards, right? And before, I mean, it was fun. You, you cover a lot of things. You'd say, oh, look, we can do some signal processing. We can do some control. Oh, let's do some finance. But it was a huge pain in the ass to come up with problems that didn't require a huge amount of coding and stuff like that, right? Afterwards, you can do anything in no more than 10, 15 lines, anything. And so as a result, we do. So when you take the 10-week class, you do not get out of that class. You will have done, before you leave, period, you will have actually done, and I mean like coded stuff. It's 15 lines. That's not even coding, right? That's barely scripting, right? But you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do, do finance. You're going to do medical imaging. 
You're going to do, uh, you know, you can do machine learning. You're going to do everything. You're going to do statistics. You can do all sorts of stuff uh, and actually do it. So it's a lot of fun. Um, I should say, um, oh, and of course these methods, are, they're slower than custom methods, but often not much. So actually that's one thing I have learned is, you know, that, I mean, it's, well, I, well, one joke I usually make is, do you know what happens when we use something like CVXPy to solve a least squares problem, right? Least squares problem, that's the oldest convex problem in the world. It's, you, the answer is you, set, you, set, you solve a set of linear equations. It's like an exact answer. There's an algorithm that terminates in like n cubed steps or something. I mean, it's, right? So here's what it does. It converts it into a second order cone program. That's something no one even heard of until 20 years ago. It then fires up like a homogeneous primal dual, you know, symmetric solver with a Marotra predicted correct blah, blah. Everybody got all this, right? This is, by the way, why it's not interesting to talk. So, but the point is it does all this crazy stuff that's way more complicated than just solving the normal equations. And you'd think, well, that's a disaster. Here's the weird part. It's not. It's maybe 3 to 5x slower. That's all, right? And, but the fact that it's so expressive, the language, way, way comp. I mean, if you're always going to be solving, if you do finance and you're solving the same stupid problem all day, all day long, go ahead, get yourself a customer. Same if, you, if you're doing a L1 regularized logistic and that's all you do, right, go ahead and make yourself a custom thing and have it be five times faster. Go right ahead, right? But this is, the, the idea is, in my opinion, the being expressive and general is, and by the way, having something that works with no babysitting, that's parameter tuning. If you do deep learning, you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> is actually has a huge value, right? So, okay. So what we're going to do in the remaining time, which is not much, is we're just going to look at some examples. Um, we're going to come back and look at examples later. Uh, the second lecture, which we'll get into next time, a little bit behind here, um, is, uh, but we're just going to look at some examples. And so we're going to just, and they're selected from these gross categories of things, right? So the first one's going to be radiation treatment planning, right? So the idea is you have somebody with a, uh, you know, with a, a tumor that a surgeon, surgeons not known for their humility, I might add, uh, generically, I have friends who are surgeons, right? Um, and they look at the image and they go, no, 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 that's way too close to the X. I, you know, even I can't do that <laughs> surgery, right? So for people like this, I mean, what they do is they actually, they'll actually take a linear accelerator or some other, uh, s some source like that, and they'll actually aim it, uh, these beams that go through uh, a patient. And so it's actually, these are sort of, they're amazing things. Um, but anyway, but the idea is you have a bunch of beams, yeah, maybe 1,000, 10,000, depends on the machine and how you set it up and how you do all this. Um, and you can control uh, the amount in each beam, right? So when you do that by lead, uh, lead, a lead collimator that kind of can move in and out and you can program it. Um, and what will happen is you'll have, let's say, a million voxels, right? So you'll have, uh, you know, uh, something like, or, or more, doesn't, or less. You have 100 by 100 by 100 uh, region, wherever the tumor is, right? Like over here. And... They'll, and there'll be a, you have a mil, let's say a million voxels, and then you have a y equals ax. Now, a, this says that the mapping from the beam intensities into the, the voxel received dosage is linear, right? And by the way, it is not complicated. I don't fully understand it. Um, so, but this is it. It's quite complicated. I mean, the simple models are simple, right? They're just sort of geometric. They say that it, 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 it goes out this way, the beam has a certain divergence, and, you know, blah, it attenuates by a certain amount as it goes through, and all this kind of stuff, right? Complicated models including, include things like scattering off of bone and things like that, right? But in any case, you get y equals ax. And the idea is to choose the, beam, uh, the beams in order to, do, to give a prescribed uh, radiation dose di. And what you want is you'd ideally like to, pr to give nothing to the non-tumor voxels. And uh, the, the prescribed dose on the tumor voxels might be, you know, 50 grays or something, right? So something like that. And the idea is to, to kill it or to damage it during, you know, some transcription or something like, do something to it, uh, something to uh, kill it. Um, now you can't, there's actually, it's not possible. There's no X that gives you AX equals D. So you're going to need to compromise, right? Um, and like I said, a typical problem has, you know, thousands, thousands of beams, million voxels or so. Okay. So you can write this out as a convex optimization problem. It's very, very close to what they want. In fact, it's probably exactly what they want. And here, 
So the variables would be, uh, well, uh, both the, the radiation, uh, the beams, and also the voxel, uh, the received voxel dosages. And what you do is you have uh, two objective terms. Um, the plus part is, is when that's positive, right? So if yi is bigger than di, it means you've overdosed that voxel. And this says you should charge a certain amount for that. If you underdose, that's di minus yi, the plus part of that, you should charge for that, right? Yeah. Um, and so this is actually a convex problem, right? Because this function, I don't know if you can uh, picture this in your head, uh, but it looks like that, okay? So it's got different slopes on, for, be, for being above and below. Okay, so that's a convex problem. Um, it's not differentiable, right, because of the sharp point at zero. Yeah? Is there a specific reason why you put uh, y equals ax into the, uh, into the subject two and not into the, like, plug it into the f of y? Either way. You could, no, no particular reason. I think maybe it's because it fits on slides better this way. <laughs> but you could do either way. Yeah, that's, no, you could do that. Um, so here's an example. Actually, this is a real one. Um, so this is a problem with 360 beams and third of a million voxels. And this shows the actual, this shows the actual optimal YI uh, with some fiddling with the weights, right? And it, these are, of course, slices of a 3D thing. Okay. So this is the sli these are the slices. Um, and, uh, by the way, the original plan took like, I think, eight hours of least squares fiddling with weights, because that's how they actually they do it mostly. Um, and this was something where it just took a few seconds on a GPU, using completely generic stuff. Not, 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 it was utterly generic. There's nothing specific for this, right? So that would be the, the, the picture of that. We're going to do one more, uh, maybe. I think we'll do one, one more. Um, it's something probably some of you know about. Uh, this, is an ex this would be an example of inversion. Al although, actually, it's a good example of inversion, which tells you that the name is fraud, right? Because, you know, when you're inverting something, you're not... They're usually, the things you're inverting is usually not invertible. So, but anyway, okay. So the idea is you have a, an image, and you have removed or obscured a bunch of pixels, and you, your job is to uh, inpaint them, right? To guess the ones that you haven't seen, right? So... I mean, anybody could do this. I mean, look, obviously, if, if, you, if, you, if a pixel's here and all of its neighbors are there, you could make that pixel equal to the average of the neighbors or something, right? And you'd have something that would at least look not hideous. Actually, it would look quite bad, but it wouldn't look terrible. Um, so, okay. So the idea is, uh, here's a very simple thing. I mean, I'm summarizing 10, 15 years of, uh, of image processing here. But it turns out there's a convex functional, uh, which is simply... It's actually uh, the, it's the integral of the norm of the gradient, right? When discretized, this vector here, if x represents an image, this vector here uh, is, the, is an approximation of the gradient. It's a six-dimensional vector because these are RGB values here. Um, and this says take the norm of that uh, and minimize. So this is like a, I guess, the, this is actually a sum of norms problem, I guess they call it, or... What, there's some name for it. Group lasso. There we go. I knew, I knew I could translate it to another dialect. That's statistics dialect. So, but anyway, so, okay. It's a convex problem. Uh, by the way, not differentiable. Uh, nor was this one, by the way. And I might add that one of the whole points, one of the very important points about convex optimization is differentiability is completely irrelevant, right? Which is a bit embarrassing because if you think about the, the classical course on optimization, Western course, I should add, right? It goes like this, you know, these are gradients. Here is the gradient method. Here, here is a Newton method. That's a second derivative. Then you say, we don't like to take second derivatives. So here is quasi-Newton, and here is conjugate gradients, and blah, blah, blah. But the whole thing. Then you finish the course, and someone says, excuse me, what if your objective is not differentiable? And they go, next course, yeah. or something, or the course is over. That's, if you teach that course well, you get right to that point when it, when it stops. Then you'd say, I'd love to tell you. Right? So, okay. so here's just a quick example. Um, so, it's the canonical Lena picture. Um, so, I've been actually chastised. I was told correctly by someone that we shouldn't be using the Lena picture anymore. And I agree with them completely, but here it is. I'm, that's okay. I'll probably replace it, but okay. If you don't know the history of this, you should, and it's actually fine. But anyway, all right, it's not fine, but it's okay anyway. So, uh, so here it is. So, you simply remove a bunch of... Uh, of, of uh, pixels here. And by the way, it's not, you know, these are multi multi 
multiple pixels wide, right? So these are not, uh, it's not like you're in painting a single pixel with knowing all of the neighbors, right? So here it is. And uh, if you, this is what happens when you recover it. Um, actually, with the contrast we have here with the bright light on the screen, I guarantee you can't see anything. Uh, so um, actually, the takeaway, it's shocking. If you zoom way in, you'll see artifacts. Oh, and by the way, this is not equal to that. But you, we see it that way. So this is a psycho-visual uh, uh, phenomenon. Okay? So, by the way, if you're not getting it, uh, let, let, me, let me repeat. Uh, you know, anybody, you could tell, tell you, a bunch of 16-year-olds know how to program. You could say, yeah, just go ahead. I'm gonna get you, I want you to fill in a color for each of the each of the 100,000 or whatever things that are not there. Go ahead and fill in the color. If you do a crappy job, you'll be able to read the script over it. If you do a good job, you won't. And these 16 year olds, they could do something, it would be okay, and they'd put some logic in there and they'd say, oh, if there's an edge, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, by the way, it's shockingly hard to do this in such a way that you can't see an artifact of the, these things. And you can't see one here because they're kind of isn't one. If you zoom way in, you'll see one, okay? So, how many people have seen this before? Okay, so, so just all of us, we're just supposed to take a moment of silence to realize how cool, just minimizing some stupid convex functional, how well it works, at least psycho-visually. Yes? I have a silly question, like, you, you didn't tell the system, I mean, you will tell the 16-year-old to fill the text, but you didn't tell the computer to fill the text, so I wonder how... I did. Oh, but I did. I did, I told the six, I did, I, I, told, I told the computer to choose X's that minimize that. No, 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 but what I mean is, I wonder how much text you have to put to make that formula make the whole painting go white. It would not go white. Doesn't matter how much text you put in there? Oh. <laughs> Here it is with 80%, 80% of the pixels are removed. Okay, so there it is. So one in five, you have one in five here, okay? That's the recovered one, okay? So, uh, by the way, this one, there are, you know, duh, there are uh, some artifacts. There's another question. Do you know if the pixel is corrupted? Sorry, what? Do you know if the pixel is corrupted? Yes, you do. Yes, yeah. Uh, What's that? If you oh, yes, so, the, so there was a, a question is, do we know which, which pixels have been obscured? The answer is yes, we do, yeah. Yeah. Why were the X's three-dimensional? Why were the three? Why were the X's three-dimensional? Because they're RGB. It's color. Okay. It's color, oh. right? So the gradient is six-dimensional, right? Or yeah. Uh, so this is a, a kind of misleading because this is already uh, peaceful, it's smooth, right? The image of Lena is a very specific thing. So if you had a high-frequency image, you would have never got that, right? Yes, that's true. What's your point? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this works on images that people look at. Okay, yeah, sure. Right. So, <laughs> yes, if you just take a random vector and then organize it as an image and say, try this, and go, well, you did a really crappy job. It's like, well, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It's, it's, a, it's a psychological effect. I mean, in this case, when you recover it after removing 80% of the pixels, that, it, only, it merely looks okay. You are not doing a good job of guessing the values that have been obscured, right? So, okay. All right. Um, so we'll skip what we'll do is we'll, that's, a, well, that's a maybe a, a good place to, to quit. Um, so let me just summarize a couple things. By the way, if you can, the, all of this is online, so you can look forward at them. We'll probably go over some of the other things. And then next time, this was very overview, high level. Next time, we actually are going to do some math. So, but that's going to be tomorrow. So, okay, we'll, uh, we'll quit here. <laughs>